Hi, everybody. Welcome to the OFM podcast where metabolic health matters. It's me again, Peter Defty, the the head of this mission we have. And I have one of my first lieutenants here today, Dr. Linda Frazier on, and we're going to talk about women's health, specifically getting pregnant, pregnancy, and young women's health, like up to and into Menarche at the time when they start menses. And so, Linda, welcome. Um, glad to have you on. We want to get the the person who's had, who's raised five children, is raising a bunch of grandchildren, coaching a bunch of more children, is a pediatrician, uh, and still doing pediatric work. Um, and so, you've got a little bit of expertise at this. Welcome. A little bit. A little bit. I'm not raising my grandchildren. I'm very involved, but my children are raising my grandchildren like they're supposed to be. <laughs> I'm I'm going to, I'm sure you're helping raise them in more ways than you'll want to admit to because you have them a lot and you do a lot of stuff with them. I work hard to play with them. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's part of raising them. I, I hate to say it, but that's how I try to raise my kids. <laughs> Plus, I make them do hard things, which I think is play, but sometimes they don't agree. Yep. And you make your kids do uh, hard things, whether your grandchildren or your running group kids, right? Yeah. Yep. They do hard things. Okay. So for first timers, kind of give a, a short introduction on who you are, your background, uh, not, you know, the whole thing. Because like I say, you, you've got a lot of experience, both real world as a, as a mom, a grandmother, a coach, and as a pediatrician. Uh, yeah, so uh, I went to medical school at Davis back in 1980 to 84 and then stayed there to do my pediatric residency from 84 to 88. Took an extra year because we started our family during those years. Uh, my husband and I have five children, three girls, two boys. One of the boys is special needs. Uh, of course, they're all adults now. We have 11 grandchildren, nine girls, two boys. We're very lopsided. Uh, thankfully, all local. I've been a pediatrician, well, like I said, since about 1984. I was in private practice for 15 years, uh, made a right-hand turn with my career, and went to the youth detention facility in Sacramento County for another, uh, I lost track, 17 years, I think, working in the clinic there with uh, all adolescents, actually. And um, I've been coaching youth running for, I think, 15 years, a little club team here in the um eastern part of sacramento county yeah you've done volunteer pediatrics in some pretty remote places i have i've gone had the um, privilege in the last few years since i've retired of going down to el salvador and working in a mission clinic there two weeks for the last each for the the last three years and then i also got to go on a riverboat on an amazon tributary in bolivia for two weeks a couple of years ago, unfortunately, that program is shut down or I would be back there probably right about now. Anyway, so I've had the privilege of serving elsewhere also. Yeah, doing pediatrics. Absolutely. There's lots of kids in Latin America. Love yeah. it. There's lots of kids everywhere. And we want to get them healthy. And that's what we're here for. So, Linda, um, also for the people who are new to Dr. Linda, also explain why you're part of the team because you know you come you came from a very conventional background and and how it's worked for you and how you as an athlete have come to experience and really understand OFM and you know why we're on this sort of little crusade to to save the world where we can well i i, I made a lot of mistakes earlier in my life I followed the rules for too many years um found myself uh, well, first of all, diagnosed with celiac disease in 2005, so that took care of the gluten real fast. But we had a very high carbohydrate diet. Found myself entering uh, the menopause years with some pounds that appeared out of nowhere. Couldn't really figure out what happened there. And joint swelling, uh, joint pain, all my lab work was supposedly normal. 
and my sister clued me into perhaps a different way of eating but of course i was an athlete so i knew better and i needed lots of carbohydrates uh, fast forward a few years in the late 2000 aughts and a friend of mine uh, pointed me towards paleo uh, another physician and my sister meantime had found south beach and then um, you know, I, I just wasn't doing that well. I was gluten free, but I was not carbohydrate. I was on a very high carbohydrate diet because I did what most people do and just replaced all the gluten products with non gluten products. So I still ate a lot of pasta, a lot of bread, a lot of brownies, a lot of cookies. And of course, since I was an athlete, that's what I needed, right? Um, come to find out that was actually not true. My husband and I went paleo for Lent. 2013 I think and in the space of that six weeks most of that extra few pounds disappeared um, my joint swelling disappeared uh, the following we we just stayed that way the following year I had a lifetime PR in every single athletic event that I ran every single distance uh, 5k 10k half marathon over the next year to year and a half 10 mile took that to mean that I was metabolically more fit than I had been mo probably most of my adult life. And uh, the final nail in the coffin of eating high carb was that my hemoglobin A1C was climbing almost to the pre-diabetic range. And I said, oh, no, 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 this, we're not going this way. So I, and thankfully, since I've been on a more carb restricted diet, that has declined well into the normal range and but i i'm not i don't want to go back there that's that that was very alarming to me i thought that only non-athletic overweight people had that happen but here i was athletic and not overweight and it was happening so i went stayed paleo for years um did lots more research on carbohydrate restricted diets became convinced that it was actually the way human beings were meant to eat. And then I found you, the Finney and Velex book, I think, Low Carbohydrate Performance book. Uh, I got onto your website and you were talking about strategic carbs. And I was like, what's that? What is that? How do I use it? How much? When? Because I was still looking to maximize my athletic performance, knowing that I probably peaked in terms of PRs, but my goal is to deteriorate much less quickly than the charts say I'm supposed to at my age. And that that is a goal I'm holding on to. Yeah, but and you, succeeding you, at so far. Right. But you you actually hadn't peaked yet. Because what, what was it? A year and a half ago you ran a lifetime PR in the marathon, not even age adjusted. I did run a life yes, I did run a lifetime PR in the marathon um November of twenty two. So yeah. that was kind of I mean, you and I both know that I picked a nice downhill marathon to make that happen. But but I did go faster than I'd ever gone at the age of 64 and a half. So um, that was the icing on the cake. Yeah. And and you just. Oh, I don't know. Maybe, the, maybe I have maybe the Iron Man was the icing on the cake. I did uh, think. No, I think I think there's more out there for you. It just it might take different forms. I think life's just going to continue to be well and good. And Tim, by the way, you're in Tim's man cave, and you and Tim. I noticed Tim looks really fit right now. Fitter. He does. You think so? Yeah. He I might be. Think. You know that that hiking trip probably did some good work on him, and and the kettlebell work probably did some. Now, unfortunately, that's sort of ended. So we got to find a good substitute. I've got I, I, I see him fit. So, so that's a you. You have your influence is being exerted. Let's let's just say. So let's talk, let's let's kind of, you know spread the spread the love here, and get you talking about you know your work is a, your perspective now that you're you 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 totally get the whole thing about optimizing fat metabolism and and its implications for health and performance. But also with your with your decades of experience as a as a pediatrician and in the health thing, you know we've had these great conversations. Um, you're very passionate about this, and and we I just want to get you talking because that's what the audience needs to hear is is some of the things you you speak about. So um, I think one of the great places to talk is just 
gestational health, uh, you know, just for conception, because we've had several people, um, several women, not people, women, because they're the only ones that can conceive, um, you know, get pregnant unexpectedly when they thought they weren't going to get pregnant, whether they were past or they just hadn't gotten pregnant uh, and weren't using birth control. And that was one of the first things we say. But but what are your thoughts on that, Bec especially with what you're seeing today with women's health? Well, clearly, um, what we're seeing today with women's health is basically when i walk through the grocery store or anywhere else in a large public place when i see mothers with small children um the mothers are heavy and their children are heavy and the children have a bottle of juice in the stroller so um, and a lot of these women experienced gestational diabetes during their pregnancies because they were either heavy before or gained too much weight during so my passion really is to convince younger women to establish healthy eating habits long before they want to conceive children. Uh, hyper, hyperinsulinemia is a fertility killer. It just, it's bad for fertility. And we have an epidemic of type 2 diabetes. In the older people, we have an ep epidemic of insulin resistance. We actually have a, quite an epidemic of polycystic ovarian syndrome in young women who nothing more even, than a, even down to the teens yeah pcos mm -hmm. is nothing but pcos is nothing but a manifestation of insulin resistance exactly the hyperinsulinemia causes the ovaries to produce more androgen and completely messes up all the hormonal balance they aren't having regular periods they these poor girls are putting on fat in places that they don't want it and they're often have terrible acne so it's it's it impacts their appearance long before it impacts their, for, they're aware that it's impacting their fertility. But, and the solution for years has been, we'll put them on birth control and do the name of that drug to soak up some of the testosterone. But the, the real solution is a metabolic reset. And, but unfortunately, um, the standard American diet is counter to what would be the healthiest diet for particularly young women who are prone to PCOS. And there's often a family history. So there's, there is a genetic component to this, but that doesn't mean that your genes are your destiny. That's correct. So um, I, I work with, I mean, I made all my kids in my running team sit down for a long uh, nutrition lecture last fall. Uh, it was actually the mothers were more interested than the kids but that's okay. But basically what I told them is you need to eat, you need to eat well, you need to eat high quality food, which I defined, and you need to eat till you're satisfied. We talked about what that meant. The word satiated didn't quite sink in real well with 11 and 12 year olds. And, and that they just, if they want to be the best athletes that they can be, they've got to get away from the junk food and, but eat real food, real food. I mean, get up in the morning and cook a couple of eggs. It's yummy. Throw some avocado slices on top and a little salsa and maybe some cheese. It's yummy. And but don't just pour a bowl of cereal and dash out the door. You'll be hungry in an hour. Um, your body will panic. You'll get all sweaty and uncomfortable right in the middle of a class. And you'll be reaching for your lunch by 930. And some of the kids took it to heart. Many didn't, but some of the parents were definitely listening. And and a lot, I actually had a couple of mothers who were struggling with that perimenopausal area say, you made it so simple. So that was worthwhile. But what I'm seeing is youngsters who are just overfed because they're always hungry because the food they're eating is not nutritionally dense. Yeah, and it's driving up and their then, insulin and... And drives up their insulin, plummets their blood sugar. Insulin, yep. Yep. They get grumpy. Uh, I would argue that any child over toddlerhood who gets truly irritable when they're hungry is probably glucose de sugar dependent. And I'm I'm not even going to the little bitty kids. That's a different story. They just they don't eat much and they they need a little more often eating. But we have a lot of already sugar dependent kids by elementary school that's why we give them snacks all the time yep. kids get snacks 
every two hours. It's 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 absurd. And it's all high carbohydrate. It's chips, it's cookies, it's crackers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And all they're doing is packing on um fat pounds, basically. And overfed girls grow early. They enter menarche early, which increases their risk for all kinds of things in the future. I mean, you want to look way down the line, it actually increases the risk of breast cancer. Children are meant to be lean. And our children in this country largely are not lean. They yeah, are this is something we talked about because, and this this dates us, but this is and I guess I'm probably gonna fall on my face politi- politically with the political correctness, but you know, when we were kids, because we're we're roughly the same age, when you went to elementary school, there was always like one fat kid and everybody else was yeah. string beans, right? When we were kids before yeah. before we hit puberty, that was just sort of the, the standard. Now it's like you get a you got mostly kids who are carrying extra pounds and, and one or two skinny kids. Yep. Yep. And you don't even know, I mean probably less common in children, but I mean, there's a thing called skinny fat for adults. I don't know what age that starts, probably sometime in puberty where they look skinny, but they don't have any muscle mass. And if you could do a DEXA scan on them, they've got layers of fat when it, where it doesn't belong. And that's and messing it, with their homework. It does. It does occur in young children. Um, I know, I know of a couple of instances because all the kids will eat are like chicken nuggets and French fries. Right. Which is not and a cereal and skim milk. milk. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, cereal and milk for breakfast, and heaven only knows for what for their snack. But they're snacking constantly. Juice bottles in the grocery store, like I said, um, and it's not unique to America. I saw some in El Salvador as well. Yeah, yeah, and so, and this also has things with like erratic erratic cycles right erratic cycles did you say yeah yeah erratic yeah cycles. they're all over the place their their hormones don't settle down i mean girls who've just started their periods can be pretty irregular but but it should settle down into some sort of rhythm within a few months to a year and the overfed hyperinsulinemic overweight young ladies are that's not happening they they may settle down and then later become irregular but they're they're heading towards hyperlens hyperinsulinemia because of their high carbohydrate diet and it will impact their um their cycling their fertility the other thing is because they're eating so many carbohydrates and shunning fat is uh, the girls don't have the building blocks to make the hormones they're supposed to be making let, let alone carry a pregnancy right <laughs> let's but we'll get well, to that, that, that me, just that just taxes the system even more we got we got we got lots to cover here so i'm going to add a little element to speak on too that that's you know hyperinsulinemia i just as an aside i don't want to go, go off on this but hyperinsulinemia was a hallmark of a bad COVID outcome. It was essentially a death Absolutely. sentence because that was, it was that just, was the big factor. Yeah. So that's one thing the audience should know. So, cause we're not out of the, the woods with that either, but that's what the insulin is one thing, the, the ghrelin, the leptin, those are others with the snacking. But the other thing that I also want to bring in is more of a cultural uh, thing that's also I'd like you to talk on is now you've got all these young girls on social media looking at social media they're getting the cortisol response constantly and so I want you to speak on that and then we're going to talk about a little bit about the cycle and how you know all this insulin all this cortisol and ghrelin and leptin um Where's the, where's the room for the estradiol, the progesterone, the insulin, <laughs> right? <laughs> so let, let, well, go ahead. Our, the, our stress yeah, hormones yeah. play an amazing role when we're under stress. Uh, we couldn't live without them. However, um, an abundance of cortisol at, for things that are not really life-threatening um, or potentially life-threatening 
again, it's it's causing the insulin to go up. It's causing you to lay down fat. It makes you, your blood sugar goes all over the place. It makes you anxious. Your, your doctor, Dr. Swade, addresses metabolic lack of fitness and anxiety, depression. It, it's just, it, it's just a vicious like cycle of uh, misery. And, and then we would talk about the, the poor mental health outcomes of our young people, but, but their metabolic state is playing into that. There's two parts to it. One is just that social media is pretty much a toxic place. The other is that they're not metabolically fit enough to handle stress that comes their way. And life has plenty of stress without social media. I mean, we need to be prepared to handle whatever comes our way. Stuff happens. And if you did right. get a D on an exam and your parents are going to kill you, you have good reason to be stressed. Um, but you need to be able to handle that metabolically and then with your parents. <laughs> right, right. And and the thing is, is, is with the constant pinging of our cortisol through social media, that in terms of the underlying physiology, sure, it's not the, the, the tiger jumping out of the bush to pounce on you or eat you or a a man trying to rape you uh, that you know these young girls are getting exposed to but the physiology is the same yes. as if that was the hormone the reaction is the same so you get that yeah. flight or fight response you get the the sugar burst you get the 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 sort of that feeling in you that you you've got to run basically and it's not appropriate but you're you're messing with your metabolism all the same and yeah. the extra cortisol, you will lay down fat where you don't want it because your blood sugar goes up and it's got to go somewhere. Blood sugar has to go somewhere. It can't sit in your bloodstream. Well, yep. a little bit can. What, a teaspoon at a time? Right, a teaspoon at a time. Or something. That, <laughs> that's well, all that can yeah, stay there. That's all that can stay there. That's exactly right. So we've kind of framed this all out. And so, you know, with young, with young, let's start with the young, young kids pre pre men arc you know what what are your thoughts there and, and and where we could take this well my thoughts there are that parents need to know that establishing good eating habits in childhood starts with them they can change the family tree so um need to be protein high quality fat vegetables and adequate calories for their children's not only activity but their growth which means a teenage boy may eat three burgers with cheese on top but they don't need three buns and yes it's hard on the budget but but the, the kids need to see the meals look uh proper from a very young age i i actually know somebody that you actually know i'm not going to say their name they've taught their child one third of the plate protein one third of the plate vegetables and a small third carbohydrate and she that little girl entering probably getting close to puberty knows what a healthy plate looks like because her parents have been doing this with her for years and they're or, athletes and, and, her, athlete. and her parents are i know who you're talking about and her parents are are, are beautiful specimens of of human beings they're lean they exercise right they do it right right model it they model it and they talk about it as they model it. And this is the kind of thing that parents need to have the knowledge and the desire to do because they are setting the framework. And that framework will get messed up a little bit when kids go out with their friends and do goofy things nutritionally. But if they're metabolically fit, they can handle some of that. And they may I even go off the rails for a little while. Yeah. And and that's a good point I'll I'll make uh i want to make right now is that most of the people listening to these are going to be parents and ostensibly probably females mothers because mothers do this guys are guys right so mothers the one of the things that's important to realize is it doesn't have to be per perfect especially no. with kids they have more latitude than somebody who's been on high carb for 30 or 40 years and has got metabolic syndrome that so don't don't sweat it having to be perfect, but you can take away 60, 70, 80% of those juice boxes, snacks, et cetera, by 
by feeding your children really good, nutritionally dense and balanced three meals a day and and not have to worry about it when they when they do when there's indiscretion dietary indiscretions it doesn't have to be perfect it can be it's very fungible right and and we do get some leeway with the children unless your child is already metabolically unfit and you're trying to reverse it then you got a little more work to do but that's usually in a family where everybody needs to reverse it it, it yeah a, a metabolically unfit child rarely comes out of a, a highly fit family that would be unusual yeah, yeah and it and, and part of that of course is is you know part of my three constants people have to move a lot so they're getting the new if they're getting the nutrition and they're they're in their growth states uh, lots of lots of physical activity and mental engagement and emotional support is part of that equation yep but yeah. here's a question i mean the the thing that always strikes me is i i my daughter hears parents at swim practice complain that they're just too tired to do any exercise well here's the thing they're all at swim practice and my daughter goes out for a run and all the other mothers sit they're there for an hour i don't know she and i just marvel at the fact that they have this free hour quote free their child is occupied they have a coach hopefully they trust their coach why aren't they grabbing a friend and going for a walk that's right i, I, I don't understand i mean if you don't trust the coach your kid shouldn't be there period if you think you have to watch everything and watching practice frankly isn't all that fun it's really fun to watch races but there's an hour of of time that it could be put to use just being a fitter person it's a, a walk with one of the other moms or dads is a great idea and in fact my question yeah. would be why aren't they all doing it yeah yeah also getting plenty of sun i think the fear yes. there's been a lot of fear fear mongering about skin and skin cancer and and it's done a great job to promote sales of sunscreens and everything else but um, you know people should get out like you say they got an hour to exercise in the sunlight it's not going to hurt them to go out and, and walk for an hour no and it's after school hours so the sun's low anyway but it does wonders for your mood it does wonders for all kinds of metabolic it's not just a vitamin d thing there's some other i can't even remember my husband was telling me about it there's some other impacts of the different uv lights that it, some of them will even bounce off the ground and you can get it you don't need direct sunlight but you still benefit from them and people need to be out in the sun they need to be moving and their children need to see them moving that's right that really is the most important as we thing. talk about female health and youth health it's like the message here to the listener is set the example <laughs> absolutely you set the example with your what you do with your time and what you buy at the grocery store and what you put on their plates and what you send in their lunches and it's really amazing um one of my daughters has her kids pack their own lunches on sunday night they pack all five and for all the whole week and she um she sent a picture of one of the lunches to the rest of us because it was really quite good it was a salad with some meat and cheese and some fruit and some nuts maybe trail mix and something mm. sweet a muffin or something something sweet and she sent it out and said well this isn't bad and other people were saying well will that one pack my lunches too yeah <laughs> so but but the mom has the things in the house to make this happen yeah and, and it's interesting because i was just watching something because i'm half japanese and in japanese schools that's what they make the kids do they don't have custodians the kids clean the, the 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 class they make their lunches they do all that stuff they you know the, the japanese culture you know it's it's just set up that way to where the kids learn these things early on well yeah we we could we could get into a whole discussion about how we don't teach our children skills that they're going to need but that's that's a whole <laughs> separate issue <laughs> yeah but it's it's part of the thing so moving along here so you know 
gestation for for the listeners in terms of the health of the mother during gestation and how that's going to impact the child's health both both as a a, a baby you know and during birth during uh, infant and weaning toddler and young adult but you know before menarch well there's no question that a lean fit mother who gains an appropriate amount of weight for a pregnancy has all kinds of wonderful thing happen. Like usually they are able to have a normal birth, which means the baby went through the birth canal, which changes the baby's gut biome from day one. Um, they are more likely to recover quickly and therefore be more successful at nursing, which changes the risk of all kinds of chronic diseases for their child and also reduces the risk of breast cancer for the mother. Um, the, the overfed baby, that is the baby whose mother has insulin resistance during the pregnancy is usually larger and therefore more likely to have a C-section, to be born by C-section. Uh, if the mother truly has out of control diabetes, there's a whole host of other complications. But we're just talking about the kid whose mom uh, is insulin resistant, put on a little too much weight and her glucose tolerance test wasn't normal and she was called a gestational diabetic. This is a woman who probably has chronic insulin resistance, but the pregnancy tipped her over into something measurable. Though um, those babies um, are born bigger, they stay bigger, they have not all the right kinds of fat in all the right kinds of places. They're kind of cute and chubby when they're first born but they often go on to be heavy children. And of course, again, we've got family eating habits that are probably not ideal. So in the best of all worlds, all women would start their pregnancies lean and fit, and then they would stay fit and they would gain an appropriate amount of weight, but not too much. And they would, um, other than those first few weeks when you're barfing all the time and you eat anything that'll stay down, hopefully they'll maintain their pregnancy with high quality, nutrient dense food that feeds their baby appropriately without popping their blood sugar up um, and then causing the baby to put out too much insulin. A baby that's born to a, pre to a diabetic mother is much more likely to have severe low blood sugar right after birth and need an IV, sometimes results in an ICU admission. Now that'll kill breastfeeding. So there's, it, it's, it's not ideal. And you know, for women who are having twins, there's actually a growth chart for how much weight a woman should gain during a healthy twin pregnancy. It's not just free for fall, oh, I'm growing two now. Yes, you're growing two babies, you're gonna gain more weight, but there is a table for a healthy gain, not a just, well, whatever happens, happens. Well, and this is a big case for optimizing fat metabolism because when you're growing a baby, you need lots of protein and fats, the fat soluble vitamins, uh, and you need that that caloric and nutrient density because protein. What people when people are all talking about protein, I'm just thinking, yeah, but what about the protein assimilation? Because you know people have gotten into this thing about lean protein and they need to have natural animal-based proteins with the fat that comes with it, like whole eggs, you know, fatty cuts of meat. Right. This the skin chicken on with the, the meat, skin on, on it the chicken. Because, yep. 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 Because, because that's what that's what assimilates the protein is the fat with the protein is what cut is what mixes with the bile so that it can be taken up and assimilated properly. So this is where, you know, because Proteins assimilate through lipoproteins, right? And, and, and it's made in these cholesterol, right. in the cholesterol that's sent to, you know, feed the baby and, and, and grow that baby as well right. as support well, the mom. And, well, yeah, you can't, you don't want to grow the baby and not nutritionally support the mom, but baby brains need lots of cholesterol. Lots. Uh, that's why breast milk is so fatty. It's got a lot of fat in it i don't remember the proportions it's obviously perfect for babies has a little yeah, bit of yeah. sugar milk 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 is the only food in that naturally occurs for mammals that's that's got high percentages of fat protein and and carbs 
because mm -hmm. it's, exactly it's real right good. At it. Right, and it it shift the profile shift between mammals, of course, but it's essentially the only food that has exists that has all three because most of your animal proteins is fat and protein and most of your vegetables and things like that is just you know water and sugar or carbs and fiber and and so you know when you look at those pressures that shaped us it's kind of like right there but you got to pay attention right right and uh anyway so unfortunately um women who go into a pregnancy less than metabolically fit put themselves and their future children at, at risk of a, some immediate complications and some long-term complications. And it, yeah. it, it doesn't have to happen, but with the ongoing government recommendations for diet that dates back to the 60s, and it's been wrong ever since, people who are trying really hard to follow the guidelines are not doing all that well actually anywhere yeah no, I, I mean that's why i said at the beginning of this is wasn't your you were doing all the right things because this was the government directed supposedly science-backed research and it's it's so embedded in our culture right now it's you know it's, we've got 50 years of this right 50 60 70 years i mean this happened when we were kids when yes. when this started um it started before us actually it started with when eisenhower had his heart attack and that was okay but the, it, it became sort of codified in the 60s, yeah it started right? in the 60s the is when Anthony key started gaining and then yeah. the official food pyramid came out in the early 80s that was the dietary guidelines but it was already well into the social and cultural fabric in the late 60s early 70s because you had the anti-war movement and you had a lot of you had this confluence of things you had the the anti-war movement you had the rise of of the feminist movement so you had this confluence of events and you had the the vietnam the, with the right. ramping up of the vietnam war you had the counterculture you had the rise of feminism um and so women were going into the workplace uh, and you had Ansel Keys leveraging all those things. And then you also had the Green Revolution. Remember Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Prize there in 1970 or 1971 for developing the semi-dwarf Aztec wheat, which is more toxic because <laughs> of the, the gluten in it is, is way more complex protein. What, what, a much more inflammatory pro protein than the the ancient wheats, and then we also had all these new rices. And so, by the by the mid seventies, this was well in. And then, of course, the food companies lobbied to where the dietary guidelines when they came out in the early eighties. That was just it was a done deal by now, and it's you know it's it's taken the last several decades of disaster after disaster in the health sphere. To where it's it's starting to become unraveled but like you say the government entities are still being held by the you know the food companies the health companies to maintain this status quo and, and people just need to realize it and you know start taking action to vote with their dollars in terms of what kind of food they eat and buy yep. so so the whole thing is it's historical it's embedded it's nobody's fault but if you don't even though it's nobody's fault you got to take action into your own hands and you can with our help yep. right linda we can help well out. you know the thing is we're not alone out there there's there's um we may have our differences with these people but lauren cordain even atkins Bolek and Finney, now Tim Noakes out of South Africa, nearly lost his medical license for saying I've been wrong and I'm fixing it and they wanted to take his medical license away. Um, some other guy I just saw on the internet, you're friends with him on Facebook, but I can't remember his name. Um, it's, it's out there. It's yep. just that every time one of these people speaks, somebody puts up, this person is a... This person is dangerous for you. You have to have a car. You, carbohydrates are, I read this the other day. Carbohydrates are required for life. 
Well, at the elemental level, that's true, but our body can make glucose out of pretty much anything. So and well, the liver, the liver does a, a a wonderful job of taking liver fat and making it into glucose and ketones. Yep. You know, so to the point where to the point where this is what I love though, to the point where it can be so good about it that it, that's that's a hallmark of late stage type two diabetes. Runaway glucagon. And and all of a sudden the, right. the liver's just in gluco kicked into new gluconeogenesis and can't shut it off. Right. Well, and that's that's pretty late. But but I mean, if the who was the guy that, that traveled with the Inuits up in Alaska and went six months on seal meat? And and then he said, I humans don't need this other stuff. And then he went into the lab. This was in the early 1900s, I think. Went into a lab yeah. for six months and ate only meat. And he did fine. I mean, that sounds kind of boring to me, but the bottom line is there's no essential carbohydrate that you have to ingest. Do we need some uh, sugar to live? Yeah, but our body can make it. it makes plenty of it. Yeah. From yeah. Plenty of it. So assuming right. your liver's healthy and all, all other things being equal, we, we can get by. I mean, that's the reason that humans can fast for extended periods of time. I mean, That's I don't exactly recommend right. when, a when they're, 40 day when they're fast, but yeah. So when we're talking about this, again, I want to qualify this in terms of real world terms. While we're talking about technically you do not need carbohydrate because your body can make it. The audience needs to understand. We're not saying don't eat carbohydrates. Don't be freaked out about sugar. It's, it's that, non -star like non-starchy vegetables the way we teach people to eat in OFM is non-starchy vegetables don't they don't count you can have as much or as little as you want of them because they simply when they're digested they simply do not count as a carb count doesn't count as a net carb a free carb whatever these dietary systems have because your body actually when when a non-starchy vegetable and non-starchy fruits you eat as vegetables like tomatoes blah 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 when your body digests them they actually get converted most of that carb of what little is in there gets converted into short chain fatty acids in your colon so it's it's just they don't count so those are great to satiate you fill you up and restrict calories so those kind of carbs yeah, so people don't, don't need to restrict calories butter and parmesan cheese on top make them really yummy yeah, exactly. Uh, well, that's how we do the fat macro, right? As much fat right. as you need to, to make it taste good or to cook it in. <laughs> right. Right. Or, you know, um, some people do have, some people are so active that they really have high caloric needs and there's no harm in doing that to get a th few extra calories in. Now, he, and here's the deal. And here's the deal in terms of, of being able to tolerate carbohydrates. And, and you found that this out with your own journey is if you're sedentary, you've lost the metabolic capacity. If you got too much junky food and you're running on sugar, you've lost metabolic capacity. This is on a cell, cell wall, mitochondrial level. The more active you get, the more you build your metabolic capacity, the more tolerance you're going to have for, for carbohydrate. So then all of a sudden you can reintroduce things that previously would, would mess you up metabolically. And they won't have that same effect. And that's what we see consistently with people like Linda and all the athletes we do that, that when you build your metabolic capacity, you actually can tolerate quite a lot of carbohydrate. And then, then that takes us, that puts the whole dietary aspect into another realm where you don't think of as a diet. Now you don't, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure at this point, you don't think of your diet as a diet anymore. No, it's a lifestyle. And yeah. um, certainly when I was training for Ironman, there were more carbs going in on a lot of those training days than would have been on a sedentary day. And between, between refeeds after, you know, three hour bike rides and a little, what do you call it the night before? A little strategic carb before carb tomorrow. Carb sneak. A carb sneak. Carb sneak between before tomorrow's two hour run. I, I, I wasn't really restricting carbohydrates much at all during those months because six days a week, I was doing something fairly big because you had me on a crazy schedule. Um, 
But no, we but, had you on an Iron Man schedule. <laughs> we did, but but it felt a little crazy. And uh, but that's you know when I when I pull back from something that crazy, um, my I would guess. I mean, I'm small. I would guess that most days I'm hitting 80 to 85 grams of carbs, just just with my regular diet. But I don't really think about it much. It's just kind of what i eat and that's if i figure it out that's about the number and then there's you know there's a bump if i'm going to do a really hard workout there's a either i come home really hungry because you know i went out fasted and it's now 10 and i just run two hours um so i'm hungrier and and then i you know it, the carbs bump as the meal gets bigger they bump a little but but not real not a lot no, it's not. It's not crazy. Not it's not. It's not. Right? The, it's not the pasta feed where it's naked carbs. No, 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 yeah. no, no. It might be um, an extra quarter cup of smoothie, well, maybe a little extra dark chocolate after lunch. You know, it's it's just not. It's just not. And my my favorite carb sneak is potatoes. That's the one that works best for me. So, the night before a big big something i might have a small baked potato with some butter on it but it's no it's not a diet well i mean i guess it is legal officially but i don't think of it it's just the it's, not, it's not a highly structured rigid diet well you don't know me i'm a person of habit i eat almost the same thing for breakfast every day but but i like it <laughs> and yeah, it meets no, the criteria <laughs> now you know talking about you know, young girls, you know, at Menarch and how important establishing that great, good nutrition is. And, and that's, that goes in as they, you know, as they get into sports or whatever, also the, the, the mental aspects, but, you know, you were talking about some of the stuff as a woman goes through those, those different phases in life. We didn't, you know, the PCOS, the fertility, but there's also, um, you know, we have the thing where one of the things that another thing that we probably should mention in terms of optimizing fat metabolism and getting people on a on on a really good trajectory so they have that upward cascade is is what I was saying earlier about protein assimilation is is the you know and it's termed you know there's a medical term for it that's not official but it's common it's called the four Fs. Yeah. Male, fat, forty, and fertile, and, yeah. or, or female, fat, fertile, forty, and an athlete. Because because athletes also they might not be fat, but because they're athletic and they're doing high carb, they get the same effect that their bile ducts get clogged because they're on a high carb, low fat diet, um, and they wind up with gallbladder issues. Well, you know, one of the things I didn't realize, and I should have, because I think about, I know, I, I know what makes the gallbladder contract and squeeze everything out into the gut. And it's, it's the intake of, of fat in your diet. It's breaking a fast with a fat and protein rich meal. Right. And the, the gallbladder sees this coming and it gives a nice tight, nice big squeeze and squirts all the bile into the gut just at the right time to digest all that food that's coming through. What I didn't realize until the last few years is that if you nibble all day long and the yep. gallbladder sees a little bit of fat, it gives a little bitty squeeze, squeeze. So it doesn't empty. It just kind of goes a little squirt. And what happens is then the, the rest of it just sits there. And then the yep. next meal comes along and it gives a little squirt and the rest of it just sits there. So we're back to three quality meals a day where your gallbladder goes big squirt and it empties completely nothing sits there in sledges and then it builds up for the next really big squirt and you know my husband is not female and he's not never had a baby but he ended up with terrible gallbladder problems a a loaded gallbladder full of stones um not in good shape and then he was he was popping stones in, into his pancreatic duct that was making him violently ill but i i look back at how we were eating all those years and he'd have a bowl of cereal with non-fat milk 
and probably just enough for his gallbladder to go a little bitty squirt. And I, I don't remember what he had for lunch, probably in a sandwich and banana. So then a little bitty squirt. And that stuff sat there and sludged and stoned up for probably 20 years before we realized he was in trouble. And um, this is one of those things that if, I, if I'd known then what I understand now, we wouldn't have been eating that way. Yeah, and and it's and and what I was saying with the four Fs, it's 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 actually I think the most common, if not one of the most common uh, procedures in women in their mid thirties to mid fifties. Absolutely, a, a, and some of them are really, really, really sick when it finally happens. I mean, it a bad gallbladder infection from obstruction can be almost deadly, or deadly even, but. I mean, some of the women get little symptoms and they sort of see the future coming and they get it out before they're really sick. But some women get very, very, very ill. And actually some men too. My husband was pretty darn sick. He wasn't well, infected, not, thank God. But. And here's the thing, you, you know, unfortunately, you know, and I'll put on my tinfoil hat again, we've dumbed down health and, and it everybody accepts in the medical community that it's no big deal to have your gallbladder removed and just have it dribbling bile all day long, which I think is crazy. It's it's a lot less desirable to have your gallbladder taken than have it intact and working fu functioning fine. Right, and well, unfortunately, by the time we realize that people have failed, they're they're tr totally failed. I mean, they, yeah, there's no other option. So, but again, we're back to. Uh, meals need to be spread out. The pancreas needs to rest. The gallbladder needs to rest so it can give a big fat squeeze with your next meal. Uh, frankly, the brain needs to rest. Uh, the whole, our gut needs to have that, what's it called, where the, it flushes, that the wave that flushes everything through. It, you have to go a certain amount of time between meals for that to happen. And you mean people the autophagy? Yeah, if people who are uh, constantly in their gut never get that wash, end up with small bowel intestinal overgrowth. I mean, it's just this it's, is not the, the way. It, yeah, it's we the cascade. To, it's the downward cascade, not the upward right. cascade. This is not the way we were meant to be. Um, no matter your philosoph philosophy on how we came to be, prior to agriculture, ten thousand years ago, people did not nibble all day. They only ate fruit for what two weeks in the summer? No, it was three to five times a year, and it would only be for yeah. for for a week, a couple of weeks, maybe, a week per, at the yeah. most. Per, yeah, a per, week at the most. Yeah, per product, and they didn't have nearly the sugar content they do now. I mean, a, a right. little apple off a tree back then didn't wasn't as sweet as ours. Um, so the rest of the year, what was their carb intake? I mean, they ate small and large mammals and some greens. There wasn't maybe, in depending on where you were, maybe some tubers. There. Yeah, that. But the tubers were also seasonal, so it's just it's Absolutely. either you know, it's like I said, we found, we figured out as humans when we traded a big gut for a big brain that following the great ruminant herds and the and finding the fisheries, uh, and the, and the you know the the migrations of of, of, birds you know, we had a reliable food source, but it took a lot of energy to get that food source and some risk. So we went through these periods of feasting and fasting. Now, you know, in terms of, of women, the long-term trajectory of a young woman, one of the reasons I think that this is a medical condition that's so pronounced in, in females is the, the, the scenario is the woman gets pregnant, has a couple of children, right? She, hormonally she's she's producing a lot of cholesterol to build babies and she's nursing that babies which again requires a lot of cholesterol mm -hmm. um and then all of a sudden she stops well and and she's she's hypercaloric because we most people get more calories than they expend over over a period of time so where's all that energy going to go the body so what i you know because Females are cholesterol making machines. That's, you know, they're made to eat and save for two. And, and that's the right. biological function. So that's where I see that, 
you know, all this now all of a sudden they're they're producing a lot of cholesterol. And where's it going to go if 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 it's not going into their bloodstream for blood cholesterol to rebuild cells? It's going to go to their gall. The excess is going to go to their gallbladder. So if they're not clearing their well, gallbladder, we've 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 complicated this even more. Um, we women have much more control over our baby timing than we ever did historically. And women are having fewer babies. So we're not doing that seven or eight times in a row every two years, most of us. So that extra, those extra calories never get used up after that final baby. They just kind of keep packing away. And then as part of controlling our baby timing, we use hormonal products that make us hungry to keep from having babies. So while not all yeah, women well, they're, gain they're, weight. They're keeping, a, they're, not, they're keeping us from, have, they're keeping a woman from having babies, but it's telling her body that she's ha gonna have a baby, so she's better eat. <laughs> right, right. Progesterone makes most women hungry. And they say, well, you don't have to gain weight on the pill. True, if you don't change your caloric intake. But the problem is if you're hungry, you can only resist that for so long. And uh, it just, a lot of women really, really, really struggle with weight when they're on hormonal birth control. So then we, you know, we've just added to the problem. So they're not having seven or eight babies anymore. Not necessarily a bad thing. And certainly a matter of choice these days. But to prevent that, we, we mess with the metabolism. That's a good point. I don't have That's a, a really great solution point. for that. I mean, I've got some ideas that, but that those are personal decisions, but people need to be aware that they're doing that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we've had a lot of good, good conversation here. So I think there's a lot of usable nuggets, any more usable nuggets that people can take home to apply. I think, I think it's great that set the example um i'll i'll add one um if you're if you're listening to this you're probably fairly health oriented and fairly active so one of the things i do with my kids when i have them as soon as we do a physical activity i feed them because they're usually hungry and they will eat whatever's put on their plate that's a, that's that's my strategy it's usually meat yeah <laughs> i mean meat or menudo as you saw linda but right um, right but my kids are like steak eating, chicken eating fiends. That, but but it's like they really. I I found that with almost all kids, it's like you get them, you feed them a fair in a fairly tight window after you've done some physical activity. They're pretty good eaters, even if they're picky eaters. Right. Well, and this notion that children should decide what they're going to eat is kind of a little crazy, anyway. every every family needs to have their own rules ours when they were really little is that gr those little green things on your plate you had to eat the number you were old and yes i held dessert over their head uh, but the idea that a child can say i don't like this that their mother or father just spent time preparing and they want chicken nuggets or they want craft dinner don't call it macaroni and cheese, uh, is nuts. Ch children have poor judgment <laughs> in general. We we don't let them cross streets before they've learned to go both directions, look both directions. And we don't should not be letting them choose what to eat at age two, three, five, seven. That's absurd. Yeah, and I think a lot of mothers are so concerned about their children that they're they like they got to eat. It's like no, they're not going to die. And I think that's a message that people need to be reassured that yeah. you, it's okay for your children to have a little bit of discomfort because they'll eat when they're hungry. Right, right. And if you fill them up on that garbage, the the nutrients never go in. They're just they yeah, and it's hormonally programming them to 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 continue. To, into the metabolic derangement yeah so 
All right. Well, when other... my middle daughter, when my middle daughter switched their family diet, and it's been many years now, uh, she told her husband, "Hey, how do you feel about eating more meat and vegetables and less cereal?" And well, he's a he's a pretty normal guy. He thought the meat part sounded pretty good, so he was all in for it. But they they were early married, not a lot of money. They decide they better eat up what's in the cabinet first because you don't want to waste food, right? And they each had a bowl of cereal for breakfast. And by 9.30, they were both hungry and talking to each other on the phone. And they took the rest of it to the food bank. Then yep. after that, you know, they, they get up and they eat something really high quality every morning. Their children fix breakfast from things that are in the house that are as high quality. And they have a variety of things that they fix. And, uh, you know, again, it's not perfect. but the whole family's on the right trajectory and their their youngest is one and eating solids and his favorite food is little cheese squares and little turkey squares he just thinks yep. that's the best food in the world so he's on even even the one year old who just weaned is on the right trajectory but but it's because the whole household is eating that way which you know the parents are in charge yep I think that that's, you know, to close this out, I mean, the implications for young females, you know, pre menarche and into menarche, and in that stage, once they start their cycle through getting into full adulthood, it's just, it's absolutely critical that they not only get the right nutrition, the balanced nutrition, but, you know, the support, the examples you know, like we were talking about how society and culture has shifted to this online cortisol, stress, anxiety producing medium that young girls are particularly prone to. Um, well, apparently I, you know, girls, and, girls won't eat around each other at school anymore. They're skipping lunch. Wow. Yeah. So at least in our area. So I told my athlete girls, you just keep munching away on your lunch and look at your friends and say, I'm an athlete. I have to eat. Just hang on to that line. I'm an athlete. I have to eat. Well, yeah. And that's it. And that's the funny thing because with the, with the social online thing, with these images of what is, what is supposed you're supposed to look like. And then it's at a time when, you know, when a woman is maturing into those childbearing years, they're particularly conscious of their, appearance because they want to appear viable and attractive to the other sex i mean it's all part of it to me it's all just biology right um, but what's more attractive getting, than a fit healthy young woman i i agree but the message they're getting is right and and the other thing here's the other factor too that we that the, the listeners need to have and have a talk with their kids is about the cycle of life because young women because women are the are the sex that brings that gives life you know men are the, the the ones that go hunt and kill and destroy and and war with other tribes we're the guys that just destroy you know guys destroy things and kill women are the life gear so you know the message right now is so bifurcated it's like oh we don't want to kill so this veganism and vegetarianism is really taken off with young women mm -hmm. because you know and 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 it's like they're not getting the whole message that this is you know humans are part of a, bi a larger biological system and we don't have the digestive tract to be vegetarians cows ruminants have a digestive tract that makes them very capable of being a vegetarian vegan right? right and they they can digest cellulose which we can't but they can do it for us and they do a very That's nice right. job of it right and that's exactly it that's part of the the cycle of life and and they need to understand that you know you need to be not a, it's okay to eat meat you don't need a lot you just need meat you need eggs you need these kinds of animal based proteins and fats to be healthy and 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 yeah you know i can tell i can actually help somebody do a vegan diet i've done a lot of research but it's really hard whereas you know you give people eggs some steak a few liver capsules some bone broth they're set yep 
right? It, it, it's, it's, yeah. it's they not don't have to worry about that. They're missing a nutrient somewhere. Exactly. They they're not, they're not missing their B12. They're not missing their, their EPA and DHA or central omega threes. You know, they're not missing their vitamin K2. They're not missing, you know, so many the amino acid that, that they need to fix that muscle tonight. They're not missing the choline, which is key to their, their mental health and, and their physiology. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Uh, the carnitine. I mean, the reason it's called carnitine is the root word is carne, which is Latin. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things I put people on when they're doing a vegan diet is they got to be supplementing with carnitine and taurine and choline and all these crazy things. It's, and, and, it, and it never, it never works out as well as how, whether it's God or evolution, however we want to look at it. It's just like we evolved and, or were created to, the, to do this and be part of that, that larger cycle of life. So I hope that that helps people understand that because we are digestively, we are omni omnivorous carnivores. We're not even omnivores. We're, you know, bears and pigs are true omnivores because they have a big cecum. They have a big hindgut. Humans don't have a very big hindgut. And as you know, as a doctor, we don't have a cecum. We have a, this little remnant thing called append an appendix. And yep. You know, and we're acid digesters. Yep. We're not, we're not hind gut digesters. So, um, and you know, as I also say, I've got my eyes in the front of my head. I have K9 teeth and I only have one stomach and, yep. you know, you yep. know, like it or not, we're, we're predators. So, um, yeah, this is, this is real critical. That That's a real critical message for young females to get is they need some, animal-based protein in that diet with the fat that it comes with naturally. Well, that's what I work on with my young athletes. And of course they're motivated by doing well athletically, but they can't possibly do that if they're not healthy. So um, hopefully they're motivated and I will keep working on it as long as I work with children and I do the same thing. I mean, I, I saw a 12 year old who already has been diagnosed in El Salvador, who's already been diagnosed with PCOS and clearly has some metabolic syndrome and the mom's like yeah our whole family has diabetes and i looked at this beautiful 12 year old and i said and you are going to change your family tree and here's how you're going to do it and of course i had to have all that translated into spanish but i said you're going to be the family expert on carbohydrates you're going to be the one that that changes this and if your family wants to come along for the ride more power to them and the mom just looked shocked, like she'd never really heard that you could intervene in a family history of type 2 diabetes. So I don't know what happened. I hope to see her again next year. And I told her that I'm, I'm just truly praying that she and her mom took it to heart. I wrote it all out in very neat printing and my translator wrote it all out in very neat Spanish for them. And I tried to break it down to very simple. And I said, this this changes your family tree. You are going to be the first family member who never gets type 2 diabetes. Well, and it, it, interestingly enough, having lived in Mexico and Central America, culturally, you know, that's that's an interesting topic you bring up because, you know, they can, they'll get the diabetes diagnosis, they'll get on the metformin, and they'll think, hey, you know, that's what my doctor told me. And, and I've had people here say the same thing. And then when, when, you know, the, the, the complications get serious, it's like, why didn't anybody tell me this? Right. Oh, and th this young woman is just gorgeous, Peter. I, 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 I just hope that she took it to heart and I kind of hope her mom did too. Cause yeah, I don't want that. Well, did you, tell, did you tell her to get her vitamin D, get vitamin D too? Because that's another thing that those kids need. Peter money's tight. I'll be happy if she starts eating plenty of protein and fat. Eggs and okay. fish. Well, I got, I got yeah. To... yeah, and Instead if you get that in the sun more. Yeah, oh, one God. thing at a time, right? I, I, had a, I had a pupusa last night, actually. But now and then it's fine. Yeah, I also had four tacos, but I just I just had the meat. <laughs> so. Well, anyway. There we go. So. Well, thanks, Linda, for, for this sure. and sharing your passion and being part of our team because... You know, you heard me rant about 
being, you know, knowing what's happening metabolically and physiologically with young women at the, at the time of their life, they should be eating and being active and, and learning to be secure in themselves rather than insecure in themselves. Uh, they're getting all the wrong messages. And, and I hope maybe, you know, we've gotten to a few parents uh, to recognize this and, and uh, we're here to help. So keep up the good work and let's brag a little bit. Your team with your help, not just as a coach, but with nutrition, they did really well, didn't they? At the na- last year's nationals. We had eight athletes on the top 25 um, podium for their eight, for their individual ages. We had, I think our highest place team was seventh out of 25. But um, this meet features a lot of like all-star teams where a coach will go find all the best runners in the state and put them together. My team's not that. My team is all comers. So a team of mostly 11-year-olds and maybe one 12-year-old took seventh out of 25 teams, my 11, 12 boys. So I was very, very pleased with that performance. And two of those boys were on the top 25 podium. So we do, we do not embarrass ourselves when we go by any means. And uh, they have a good time and I'm always really proud of them. They do, they do a great job. And in our local area, um, I had, I had three girls in the, in seventh, eighth grade races take top three spots out of 240 girls. So they're hard workers. They're good kids. And they have a lot of fun. You know, and there's one thing I forgot to mention that I'll bring up now because if we still got people listening, it's important to know. One of the things in running that I noticed with gestational women is if they stayed running and walking a lot through their pregnancy, not one that I've ever known has not had a completely normal birth with a normal weight, healthy baby. My daughter who had twins in a military hospital was walking till the very end. I think she stopped running at 17 weeks, but just kept walking to the very end and had a vaginal birth of twin babies at six pounds each. That's they were, that's two weeks, they were, they were just, a, just around three weeks early, but they were, she had 12 pounds of baby in there Right. and she's not a very big girl. So, but she did stay walking. She did follow the weight curve for perfect perfect twin pregnancy and she just she just kept moving and eating right and it all turned out beautifully yeah yeah, and those girls are now almost 12 yeah and i've I've seen this with with all the women i've known in our in the running club in davis the ones that run through their pregnancy Mm -hmm. it's it's like boom then the next pregnancy boom no problem yeah and even if they get to the point where running is just super uncomfortable they do keep moving they're out walking instead and, yeah. and that, I think that's all it takes is ju- you've just got to keep moving. It, it keeps the pelvis strong. It keeps the, the extra weight down. It keeps your metabolic status good. You're not, you're not a type two, you're not a gestational diabetic and just everything just goes better. Yeah. And you're not, so, you're not, you're not building an oversized baby that can't come out. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Nope. You're building the size that you can pop out. Push out, pop out. There you go. Well, we'll pop out of here. Thanks again okay. for, for a great time. And My pleasure. Uh, we'll have you on again because we're going to need your expertise. Okay. Well, whatever I can do to help. You know me. Yep. Thanks. <laughs>